in our virtual book signing. I'm sorry I couldn't come. Um, it was one of the, it was, it was quite a weird experience to live through because about two weeks out, we started going, huh, I wonder if we should think about this a minute. And then we decided that starting it out with the virus live in Washington state where I live, we thought maybe we should not go to Emerald City Comic Con and go have um, go uh, go participate um, in a in a single building with 97 98,000 other people and um, and then go on seven planes and go to seven different places and it just seemed like I would be a really good disease vector and I don't like to kill off my readers so I decided that we just maybe not do Emerald City Comic Con and then go and a few more days passed and we went you know, maybe it's really a not good idea to go, but we could drive to Seattle because that's just a little ways away. So we'll just drive to Seattle. And I proposed that to our publicist, uh, Alexis. Hi, Alexis, uh, over at Penguin. And I got, and, and we were like, okay, that would be awesome. And then she came back almost immediately and said, okay, well, all Seattle events are canceled. So that's how that went. And I talked a little bit with Ann Sowards, my editor at Penguin today about um, the oddities of having a book come out in the time of coronavirus. And I don't know how it's going to affect book sales, paperback, hardback book sales. I do know that it's, it's going to be hard on your bookstore. It's going to be very hard on. So here is my plug for Mysterious Galaxy. Um, I am pretty sure, are they in? Do you know, are they, um, this is my trusty assistant back behind me and my cat making noise. Yes, he um, wants to cover the he, Right. Uh, you can bring him bring him around so everybody can see. You might as well. You might as well. Here's the camera. So helper. there we go. This is my helper. This is Poe. Um, he's beautiful, but not too smart. He doesn't need to be both. Um, do, do, are, is Mysterious Galaxy shipping out books? I think so. I did not. So ask so um, go check out and see if they're online. If they have an online bookstore and help support them through this because it's really important to help our independent bookstores stay um, up and about. And Mysterious Galaxy is one of my favorites. So um, I we wanted to do a plug plug for them. So we're going to start out. Hello, everybody. I'm just looking down and seeing all the people uh, people checking in with us. Um, I'm going to start out by reading from Smoke Bitten. And Sparky and I were talking a little bit. That's Sparky is and my trusty assistant. We're talking a little bit about what to read from. And she was voting for the glitter bomb. And I was just a little too worried that there was um, too many giveaways. It, the book has been out for uh, a little over a week now. Uh, and But there are enough people out there, I think, that haven't read it that I didn't want to. Um, I need to remember to look at the camera and look at all of you guys there. It's it's disconcerting because my computer is actually, the camera's not actually on my computer. So if I glance to see where you guys are, I'm not actually looking at my computer or at the camera. So anyway, uh, I decided to read from the first chapter. And this is what happens when I have nobody to ask me questions is I just babble endlessly. <laughs> so good luck with that. Are you okay, Mercy? Tad asked me as he disconnected the wiring harness from the headlight of the 2000 Jetta we were looking on, working on. We were replacing a radiator. To do that, we had to take the whole front clip off. It was a brush case, a case on a couple of fronts. The owner had been driving from Portland to Missoula, Montana, when her car blew up the radiator. We needed to get her back on the road so she could make her job interview tomorrow at 8 a.m. The task was made more urgent by the fact that the owner and her three children under five were occupying the office. She had, she told me, family in Missoula who could watch her children, but nobody her alcoholic ex-husband to watch them, or nobody but her ex-alcoholic ex-husband to watch them in Portland, so she brought them with her. I wish she had a family here to watch them. I like kids, but tired kids cooped up in my office space were another matter. To speed up the repair, Tad was taking the left side and I was working on the right. Like me, he wore grease-stained overalls. Summer still held sway, only just, so those overalls were stained with sweat, too. Even his hair showed the effects of working in the heat, sticking out at odd angles. It also was tipped here and there with the same grease that marked the overalls. A smudge of black swooped across his white cheekbone and onto his ear like badly applied war paint. I was pretty sure that, if anything, I looked worse than he did. I'd worked on cars with Tad for more than a decade, nearly half his life. He'd left for an Ivy League education, but returned without his degree and without the cheery optimis optimism that had once been his default. 
When he'd re what he had retained was that scary competence that he'd had when I first walked into his, or his father's garage looking for a part to fix my rabbit and found the elementary age Tad ably running the whole shop. He was one of the people I most trusted in the world, and I still lied to him. Everything's fine, I said. Liar, growled Z's voice from under 68 Beetle. The little car bounced a bit like a dog responding to its master. Cars do that sometimes around the old Iron Kissed Fay? Z said something soft voice and calming in German, though I couldn't ex catch exactly what the words were. When he started talking to me again, he said, You should not lie to the Fay, Mercy. Say instead, You are not my friends. I do not trust you with my secrets, so I will not tell you what is wrong. Tad grinned at his father's grumble. You are not my friends. I do not trust you with my secrets, so I will not tell you what is wrong. I said deadpan. And that father of mine, said Tad grandly, setting across, setting, sorry, aside the headlight and starting in one of the bolts that had held in the front clip, is another lie. I love you both, I said. You love me better, said Tad. Most of the time I love you both, I told him before getting serious. Something's wrong, but it concerns another person's private issues. If that changes, you'll be the very first on my list to talk to. I would not talk about problems with my mate to someone else. It would be a betrayal. Tad leaned over, put an arm around me, and kissed the top of my head, which would have been sweet if it weren't 106 degrees outside. Though the new bays in the garage were cooler than the old ones had been, we were all drenched in sweat and the various liquids that were part of the life of a VW mechanic. Yuck! I squawked, batting him away from me. You are wet and smelly. No kisses, no touches. Ick, ick. <laughs> He laughed and went back to work, and so did I. The laugh felt good. I hadn't been doing a lot of laughing lately. There it is again, said Tad, pointing at me with his ratchet. That sad face. If you change your mind about talking to someone, I'm here. And if necessary, I can kill someone and put the body where no one will find it. Drama, drama, grumbled the old fay under the bug. Always with you children, there is drama. Hey, I said, keep that up, and next time I have a horde of zombies to destroy, I won't pick you. He grunted, either at me or at the bug. It was hard to tell, see. No one else could have done what I did, he said after a moment. It sounded arrogant, but the fake can't lie, so he thought it was true. I did, too. It is good that you have me for a friend to call upon when your drama overwhelms your life, leaving. And if you have a body, I can dispose of it in such a way that there would be nothing left to find. Z was my very good friend and useful in all sorts of ways besides hiding dead bodies, which he had done. Unlike Tad, Z wasn't an official employee of the garage he had sold to me after teaching me how to work on cars and run the business. That didn't mean he was unpaid, just that he came and went on his own terms. Or when I needed him. Z was dependable like that. Hey, said Tad, quit chatting, Mercy, and start working. I'm two bolts up on you, and one of those kids just knocked over the garbage can in the office. I'd heard it too, despite the closed door between the office and us. Additionally, just before the garbage can had fallen, I'd heard the tired and overworked mom trying to keep her oldest from reorganizing all of the parts stored for sale on the shelving units that lined the walls. Tad might be half fay, but I was a coyote in my other form. My hearing was better than his. Despite the possible destruction going on in the office, it felt good to fix the old car. I didn't know how to fix my marriage. I didn't even know what had gone wrong. Ready? asked Tad. I caught the cross member as he pulled the last bolt. A leaking radiator was something I knew how to make right. Okay. And there's the start of the story. Like, um, we posted the first chapter on our uh, Facebook page and website, and we got a lot of responses that were very unhappy with how unhappy uh, a place that Mercy and Adam started out this book in. And I have to tell everybody that Happy people are wonderful, and I love writing about happy people, but you have to start a story with unhappy people, because happy people don't have big adventures. So, um, uh, uh, Constance is going to moderate your questions. Um, I'm going to check with Sparky. Sparky, what exactly are we doing here? Uh, Constance is going to send you some questions, and then after you answer our trusty moderators questions and we can move on to the questions that people are posting. You can just read them and answer them out loud. Okay, so I'm going to repeat that just in case my microphone didn't catch it. Um, I We have uh, Constance who is our moderator from Mysterious Galaxy. Hi Constance! 
is going to uh, send me some uh, questions. And when she's done, then we'll let uh, the everybody else out there participate and answer them too. So we're running this just basically like we do a usual uh, book signing, except that you're not here. And it's only about a quarter as fun when you guys aren't here. I know, and it's harder to heckle. It, right? <laughs> So Constance's first question, what was different writing this book than the other books in the series? So what was different writing this book than the other books in the series? It has, it's really amazed me, I think, um, being on this end of my career than when I started, because I would have thought that by this time, every book would be the same, that I would be able to just sit down and write them. And that is not how it happens at all. I start out um, different places uh, with the books. And for Smoke Bitten, I had an idea. I had an idea. I, I, I wanted, um, well, we knew what the title was going to be before I started the book. Because Ann Sowers and I throw terms, random terms back and forth to each other until we come up with a title I like. So Smoke Bitten told me that I was going to write about um, something that bit, which when a werewolf book, you know, that's that's going to happen. And I don't know where I was when I finally decided um, that I was going to bring in a smoke dragon um, and what that entailed and do some more things with Underhill. I knew that I was going to have her bring her gate into, uh, put a gate into Adam at Mercy's yard about about midway through Fire Touched. I thought that would be really fun because she could put them all over in the in the reservation, so she can really just put them anywhere she feels like she has an invitation. And I figured that she would, could work her magic on somebody and get an invitation to Mercy's backyard because the, the whole time I'm writing any book. Um, when ideas occur to me that don't actually fit in the book I'm writing, I, but they're really good ideas, which means they're things that will cause Mercy a lot of trouble, because <laughs> that means it's a good idea. Um, I set them aside for a later, right, right. So I set them aside for later, later use. And um, but you know, I, it, this story more than most lately just wrote from beginning to end with for me so um, a lot of times i'll have big scenes in my head and i'll rush through to get to the big scene and then rush through to get to the next big scene and then go back and fill in this book just kind of wrote from beginning to end just very smoothly and um, i had a lot of fun with it and then i had to go back you know you always go back and you kind of weave things through um, it had it was a little more complicated than i expected it to be but um I think I think that for me, the scariest thing about writing this book, so I'm bouncing all over, but the scariest thing about writing this book was um, that I knew it had the chance of being a really powerful book, and I wasn't sure that I was going to make it. And the power in this book, unlike many of the other books that I have written in this series, um, the power in this book, I think, was really in the relationship between Mercy and Adam. And one of the things I like to do in my books is to throw away that old happily ever after adage because uh, I, my husband and I were married for over 30 years and it, every, every day was different than the one before and it was wonderful. Um, and I want, but, but, you know, there were arguments and there were fights and, and a lot of fights because Mike, Mike had a hot temper and I, and I don't, don't, back down very well and and um and we right <laughs> werewolves and we enjoyed it very much <laughs> we tended to like our fights as much as we liked making up and and so i think that that's that's okay and i wanted to to represent a relationship that was felt real to me so that it um it problems do happen but bumps do happen uh, people do get into bad places just because you have the most wonderful relationship in the world doesn't mean that you're not gonna have something terrible happen to you um, that uh, affects how you react and that will affect the relationship you have so i wanted to explore a little bit about that and i was really um, nervous about making sure that I got that in right. Um, and for me, the story worked and I hope it works for you. Question two, how have you been able to write such a long series, but always keep each book fresh and new 
giving the reader something different every time. Oh, that was really nice. So um, I, I, well, part of it was I set up the, the characters in this book to have a lot of potential stories. And I really enjoy them. And Mercy talks to me um, very, she's just a really easy character for me to get a handle on. And she's particularly easy character to write stories around because she's not stupid. She's not foolhardy, but she's a hero. She believes in right and wrong and she's really loyal to her friends and which which of course makes her the pack is a really good uh, place for her to be. Um, and if you have somebody who's loyal to your friends and they're really the sense of justice is really strong, it's pretty easy to throw uh, things in that will make them throw things into this into the pot that will make mercy jump. So getting her jump start in a story isn't hard. Um, I don't know. They feel fresh to me. I think because I, 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 I work with these people with my imaginary friends as if they were real people, and they have problems, and and they fix one problem, and another one emerges, and they take damage, and they have to deal with that. And to me, that just makes them um, fresh and interesting. And I suppose at some point in time, I might get tired just of writing urban fantasy because you know it's it's uh, although like most fantastic genres it can it, it's flexible i can write thrillers i can write uh, murder mysteries i can write uh, romance i can write any kind of genre within the the bounds of um, urban fantasy but uh, i think that uh, sometime i might get tired of writing it i mean i've been writing mercy since 2004 I think and the Alpha and Omega series I kind of feel like is part of the same overall storytelling so um, I've been hanging with the same group of friends for an awful long time and sometimes sometime I might feel like I need to freshen up but if so I'll probably just break off and do a fantasy novel or maybe a short series of short stories that are straight fantasy and come back to the Mercy books and the Alpha and Omega books then. Will we ever get more of Stefan's backstory or Wolf's? Yes, of course. I know a lot more about Stefan and Wolf than you do. Um, and Wolf is uh, making his way into being a, a more major character. Um, and Stefan has kind of gotten his feet underneath him, although he got knocked off him a little bit in this book. Um, so that he can step on the stage a little bit more. He's been broody. And when he's broody and alone and, and wants to be alone, Mercy has a tendency to leave him that way. And she hasn't had her shop up and running. And the whole thing with the vampires is kind of, uh, um, uh, what is it, wobbly? Wobble. What, is the, what, is it, what was the term from um, the uh, uh, Doctor Who episode? Timey wimey. Oh, yeah, timey wimey. Um, wibbly wobbly. Wibbly, wibbly wobbly, wobbly is the word it. I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, there's kind of. Say that again. Wibbly wobbly timey wimey. Wibbly wobbly timey wimey. Yes, yes. So, um, so he's he's he'll he's about ready to come forward. I think I'm going to do something. The next Mercy book will have something more to do with the vampires, but that's not set in stone because right now I'm working on Alpha and Omega. Next one. Do you have an adventure on your bucket list? Do I have an adventure on my bucket list? Yes, I want to go whitewater rafting. <laughs> And I just learned today that they have something called poisson, um, uh, strip poisson. And I can't say it right, I'm not French. But what poisson is, is where they get on a horse and you jump as high as you can. And that's where you get the records of how high horses jump. And if you want to scare yourself, you can, you can go look at that up on, on um, the internet and see people do really scary things. And it's not so much getting over the jump, it's the landing on the other side. Well, strip poisson, I can't say it. I've got it wrong in my head. But anyway, the strip version of the game is you are bareback. And if your horse ticks a, a rail down, it ticks one of the bars down, then you have to take something off. <laughs> and the one I have, I posted on Merry Go Round Arabia. So you can go look at that if you want to. But the, the one I posted um, uh, 
she did a very good job of, of pulling off um, things that were not too embarrassing, but they did make a limit of if you pull off four things, then you have to stop. Apparently, the last time this particular event had been held, there were a lot of people running around in bras. So um, if you want to have a giggle and go, oh my gosh, people are really crazy, um, you can go look that up. That people might not know Mary go around Arabian. Uh, right. I raise Arabian horses, and um, I did my web. My Facebook page is not very active, but we do have um, things posted up there. It's Mary Go Round Arabians on Facebook, and we did have last year. We had a Canadian national champion. She won four Canadian national championships. So that was cool. Yeah. You can see pictures of her and my friend Joan's daughter Beth, who rides her on there. If you want to look. Anyway. And for the record, if you go whitewater rafting, that's the only thing in the world I will not do with my best friend. Sparky! <laughs> you're my trusty assistant! So whitewater rafting, I think, would be really fun. Um, I'd like to ride donkeys down into the... into. I'd have to lose a lot of weight, the poor donkey. Maybe mules down into the... Um, uh, uh, Grand Canyon. I think that would be cool. The last time I was on a plane, we flew over the Grand Canyon. And I, I've done it a number of times, but for some reason, this particular plane ride, we got the best view I've ever had. It was really spectacular. It was fun. So Your idea of fun and mine are very different. <laughs> hey, you know, you're very brave. Sparky, Sparky is afraid of heights, and she goes mountain climbing. It's awesome. <laughs> Next question. How much research have you needed to do over the years for the different cultures and myths? Oh, I do a lot of research. Um, a lot of it is stuff that I already knew. Like most of you, I have read fantasy and science fiction and horror my whole life. Um, I think most of you know by now that my mother was a children's librarian and that I got started on fairy tales before I could read. My sister is four years older than I, and she shared a bedroom with me. My aunt sent her a big book of fairy tales. It was a Reader's Digest book of fairy tales. And she would read two stories every night to both of us. And it was a way to stay up later, because my mother was okay with us staying up late if we would just read. So um, I, I just know a lot of fairy tales. And that's not the only book we use, but that happened to be one that's pretty complete. It had the complete Hans Christian Andersen, the complete Grimm's fairy tales that, you know, um, and a lot of, uh, a lot of oddities um, from here and there. Um, so that's that's part of it. But the vampires, boy, I started reading uh, comic books um, mostly for the vampire and the werewolves to start out with. Um, I grew up on Kolchak, the um, the, Night Stalker. the Night Stalker. Thank you. I can remember his name, and I couldn't remember the TV show, The Night Stalker. Mm -hmm. And I can still remember him going vampire from the first episode. Vampires are seven times more stronger than people. And I thought, why seven? Even then, I'm like, why seven? Why not ten? <laughs> you know. But but um, so. Uh, so I, my whole life has been a research project for doing urban fantasy, um, and uh, but I I will say that I pick up things. Um, the whole episode in Night uh, Night Broken um, with the with the Tibisina and the uh, Guayota. I, I was literally just looking for a black dog story. I wanted to bring in a, a black dog and, and not to be something that had been overdone and, and, and fell into that one. And so that was fun. Um, but the research for this kind of book is my favorite stuff to do. This is a lot easier research than the research I used to do for this, the um, traditional fantasies. But when I get it wrong, it's a lot more people know that I've got it wrong. Um, I've had, um, I, I can um, usually, if my son reads them through for me, we he catches the incidences before I get them in. But occasionally, we've had some things sneak through. I'm not going to tell you what they are. <laughs> I know because everybody tells me what they are. <laughs> Blame it on Mercy and say right? you knew, but she didn't. Right? <laughs> well, well, okay, but it's physics things. Like, okay. I'm going to stop or if it'll know where it is. <laughs> One of your readers wants to know if Z has a pet Roomba. Does Z have a pet Roomba? Oh, oh what a good idea. What a good idea. Um, he didn't until now. Uh, I don't know that I'll be able to put it in, but I think that would be really funny. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> then the question is, would it remain in its original condition? Absolutely not. <laughs> He's a tinkerer. There's no way. 
it would probably take over the world. Maybe I should double think this. <laughs> what's what's that? Fire breathing Roomba. Fire breathing Roomba. <laughs> all right, all right. Fire breathing Roomba. Yeah, no, I I think maybe I'll have to think about this before I do that. Because <laughs> no. All right, next question. Will Samuel and Ariana get their own story? I don't know. I do know what they're doing in Africa. And I do know that it's going to come out. Um, it's, I actually thought it was going to be part of the Alpha and Omega story I'm working on now. And then started working with it a little bit more. And it might come in at the very end as a setup for the following book. We'll see how, how it feels to me. I um, A lot of writing books for me is feeling and if this, how the story, it's shape of the story feels. And if if so, if it works out, I'll put that at the end of this next Alpha and Omega book. If not, it'll come, it will come in the next one after that. And the next Alpha Omega book is Wild Sign. And I'm having a great time. I wish we, we there is a research thing that we didn't get a chance to do. So I do do uh, geographical research parties all the time. Um, grabbing Sparky, my trusty assistant, mm -hmm. and we go off and hunt things down and um, like River Marked. I don't know, were you on? Were, you I have, didn't go with you that time, but I was the one who introduced you. Yes, to the there Stonehenge you go. So, so Anne introduced us to the Stone, Stonehenge things. And, and I had I, your kids convinced that Mary Hill was inhabited by zombies. <laughs> they did. She did. She did. Uh, Sparky has been my, my kids' evil aunt Sparky their whole lives. They love her dearly. <laughs> And it was, it's for things like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I needed to go, I need to go and do a geographical uh, research trip and maybe go white water rafting if I could talk to <laughs> into it um, for this, for this one. Uh, this is a part of the country that I am not hundred percent familiar with. I have been places nearby, but not, not exactly here. So we'll, we'll see. Thank you. That leads into the next question actually, oh, which is, do you get to travel to do research for the books? And if so, where do you go? Yes, uh, wherever the books need me to go. So for um, uh, uh, for Silence Fair, Fallen, we went to Prague. For Silence Fallen, we went to Prague. Actually, we went to Prague and then I used it in Silence <laughs> Fallen, so it went backwards. Um, and that was really fun because Libor is my um, Czech publisher, my Czechia publisher. And uh, when he and his girlfriend, his then girlfriend Yitka, uh, were taking us on a, a, a river ride on the on the river, uh, they started talking about how we should have Czech werewolves and bring in the golem of Prague, and that if we did Czech werewolves, that he and Yitka and Martin wanted to be werewolves. And so when I sent Mercy to Europe, I thought, yes. Um, so when you're a writer. Um, nothing, nowhere you go, nothing you do is ever, is ever, um, useless. I, I store little gems like magpies and like my pies store, uh, shiny rocks in my head and, um, go back and revisit if necessary. But occasionally I know what I'm doing, like fair game. I knew I wanted to set it in Boston. Um, so I, I went to Boston for the first time and ran around Boston for I think about three days. Uh, we'd get up in the, early in the morning and run around until we couldn't move again and then go to bed and do it again. And I guess we got it okay because the Bostonians said that they liked it. So that was good. Um, did a lot of, I do a lot of research about places online before I go there. So I know what I need to look for and know, know where, where I need to go. Um, again, I really wish we could uh, this this part of the story would be really much easier to do if I'd actually visited the place I'm writing about. So we'll see how that works out. Um, you got to visit with a real FBI office. In that was fun. Yeah, we went to Boston. We got we got to was that was that you who finagled that? Was it Mike that finagled that that we got? I think it was Mike. Yeah. I think it was my my husband finagled us into going into the FBI office in uh, in Boston and talking to the people there, and that was way fun. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad Mike was there because I when I meet new people, I tend to go babble, babble. Instead of asking questions that make sense, that lead to play, information I can use, fortunately, Mike and Anne are very good at picking people's brains and getting them to talk. So that helps. I did get us into the Franklin County Sheriff's Yes, Department. you did get us into the Franklin County Sheriff's and Department. <laughs> and he facepalmed for us. It was awesome. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> 
So, so yeah, so, and uh, it's really fortunate for me that Sparky is very brave. She does many things that I would never have the guts to do first, other than whitewater rafting. Yeah. Of course, we could do, we could do skydiving. I'll, I'll do whitewater rafting. <laughs> See, that's how I make her do things. <laughs> so. Oh. Okay, will there be a crossover book between Mercy and Elf and Omega series? So I don't know. Um, I've been looking into, I used to say just automatically no. And there may be books in which the characters cross over, but there won't be books that are like a reunion book where you have all of the major characters come together and say, ooh, we have to do this reunion thing. Um, I have read them done by much better writers than I am, and I have never liked one. So I've decided that I probably won't do something like that. But it may be the case if I ever have a story in which one of, say, Charles would be useful to have in, in a Mercy book, or uh, Mercy or Adam would be useful to have in an Alpha and Omega book. In, in, in that circumstance, then I probably would do that. I may actually do a, a, a short story with maybe Mercy and Anna talking, talking shop or boyfriends or something like that, husbands. So... Are there any other creatures you'd like to incorporate into the Mercy series, such as a mermaid or a sphinx? Oh, there's lots of them. Genies would be fun, too. Especially evil genies. Cause, cause, <laughs> That's yeah, the best kind. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Even Z might have trouble with a genie. So we'll see. Um, I, I am... I am I'm pretty spare with the other character types um, just because it can be really easy to just go uh, next book, new monster, next book, new monster. And the problem with the series that runs this long is that I already have a cast of thousands and I already have people, every book, people are irritated because this character or that character isn't in them. And just, you know, some stories require different characters than others. Um, so I'm a little leery about bringing them in and I also have to bring them in a way that feels believable so that it doesn't ruin that um, very fine uh, line where I ask readers just for the length of time they're reading my stories to pretend that this is real and I give them no reason or very little reason or as little reason as I possibly can for them to the hind brain to say, hey, this isn't right. That's not how this would happen. Um, this isn't real. That's why I don't like my physics mistakes. Um, so if, if I can bring them in and make it feel real, then I will. That's why unicorns are so hard. Because when you bring unicorns into a story, automatically you bring in all of the, all of the uh, zeitgeist, all of the all of the stories, everything that people know about unicorns in, and the big one you know about unicorns is that they're little stuffy animals that everybody runs around and they're imaginary. So, not that I won't do that someday, but <laughs> it's going to take a lot. So there we go. Oh, I like this question. Will Ben find happiness? I love Ben. Will Ben find happiness? Well, you know, happiness means different things to different people. Um, we, we might say, will, will Ben's happiness ever involve things that we would approve of as causing happiness? Does that make sense? Sort of. So we're not going to, for instance, find him in a room with his pieces of his parents strewn all over the floor or something like that, <laughs> um, which would make him truly happy uh, for a while. Uh, but I, in my head, he does come to a much better place. He's in a much better place now than he was at the at Moon Called. And, and he's getting better uh, adventure by adventure. This one, this, uh, this book was really hard on him. So we'll see if maybe we can't be a little nicer to him in the next book. You're better. He's my favorite. Maybe. Oh, he's your favorite. Maybe I need oh, to do a George Martin. You're not movie. George Martin. Don't you do it up. <laughs> <laughs> C.S. Friedman and I um, mm -hmm. sat next to each other at panel at panels in Dark Over Con one year. And my husband started calling us Happy Bunny Patty and Kill 'em All Friedman. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Did people know? It was fun. <laughs> so, what was Mercy's mom's reaction when she first saw Mercy's coyote form? Um, I don't know. What would your reaction be when you went to change your baby and you found a coyote pup in in the bed instead? Um, I would have to write the scene, and I haven't written that scene. She's a very pragmatic, Mercy's mother. 
she's you know life is about problem solving that's the she mercy got that from her mother um so first she would have to be convinced and i don't know whether she saw mercy change or whether she just came in because that would be scary too right you come in looking for your baby and you find a puppy you're like who mm. took my baby and left a puppy in its way <laughs> right <laughs> and coyote puppies and dog puppies to the uneducated you know as in not a biologist and not really familiar with coyotes um, don't look that much different from each other, uh, especially when they're like two or three days old. So I don't know um, uh, what she did. Maybe I'll have to write that one someday. Thank you. Thank you for that idea. <laughs> uh, I would like to know about Adam's reaction to Mercy calling Bran. Is the upset coming? Oh, hang on. I am sorry. This is kind of a spoiler. Well, this I've heard this question in. a lot. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and do this one. People, if you have not read it, put your fingers in your ears and go la 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 while I talk. So go ahead and ask it. Ask All right. So is the upset coming from the cursed creature within him or from Adam and his wolf? So so the werewolves always werewolf being a werewolf is not a happy, happy, joy, joy thing unless you are an omega. Then it's okay. But werewolves always deal with this angry creature inside. You know, the, the human half is always dealing with the angry creature inside that really, I look at the werewolf wolf form sort of like um, a grizzly. Uh, grizzly bears uh, are always ready to attack, always ready to uh, go rend and tear. They, they, that's just, a, they're a lot more uh, difficult to deal with than the, than the little black bears are. Um, which would generally just leave you alone if you could. So um, they, they always have that inside them. They just get used to it and get used to dealing it. And in this book, Adam has a big problem and it means he's much more short tempered. It means he has a much harder time dealing with his wolf. And it means he's much less reasonable than he normally would be. A dominant werewolf would not be really okay with his wife calling on her uh, calling on her male relatives to go help them out in the problem. That just would be something that any any alpha would have trouble with somebody in their pack going out to for outside help. If it is your mate going out for outside help to, uh, well, if, if you reverse this and said Adam was calling all his old girlfriends or Adam was calling all these beautiful women that he knew to help him out with this problem because Mercy just wasn't good enough, what, how, would you, how would that feel, right? So he does pretty well, um, and normally, you know, Mercy was, grow was raised with werewolves. She's not just dealing with Adam, who's all the way through here. She's dealing with a man who is always, uh, always dealing with a werewolf. So she's dealing with a werewolf, a monster. And, and as much as she enjoys fighting with Adam, and she does, and it's really bad, <laughs> it's probably a bad character trait, as much as she enjoys that, she does not enjoy pushing him beyond um, the point where, sorry, hold on, I need to stay on the page. Stay on this page, thank you. Okay, sorry, my computer was acting up. Uh, it's not always, uh, it's it's a it's not a tightrope. That's the wrong word. But she's always oh she she takes his temperature emotional temperature all the time, to see where he is and and what's going on. And um and I'm just I've I, I'm lost in the babble of where I write from. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the but the answer the answer to this is is that Adam is not in a in a good place. And if Adam had been in a good place, this would not have bothered him at all. But she is aware that Adam's not in a good place, and she knows the kinds of things that bother dominant werewolves. And this is one of the things that would do that. If that helps, I hope so. <laughs> Take a drink of water, and then we'll ah, have the next question. Good. Uh, okay, a burn bright question. Was Sage's plan backstory was Sage's story planned from the beginning? Did you know from her introduction that she was a heart of state? I knew from her introduction that she was a plant. Um, and I had an idea that had to do with kind of the backstory that has been running um, that I had very quietly from Moon called all the way through to Burn Bright um, and beyond. Uh, stronger in some books than others. I didn't want to read John Neal, um, which uh, so I didn't want to. I didn't want to make it so important 
but it was, it's part of the storyline, starting part of the background of the world building that I've been doing with this. So I knew that from the beginning, and I knew that it had something to do with that. And honestly, to start out with, I didn't know where she was coming from, whether she was a plant from, from uh, allies or she was a plant from enemies. And it wasn't until about, um, no, I don't know. It was, I think it was midway through the book, the Alpha and Omega book I was writing, maybe a Silence Fallen, uh, midway through. Uh, even though it had nothing to do with Silence Fallen, I always, I, I always kind of have things going through my head about other books uh, when I'm writing the current book. And I knew then that we were going to have somebody betray the pack. And I went through different characters. I could have had, I could have had two or three of the characters do it legitimately. But I knew that I had this bigger story for Sage, and I knew that the relationship between Sage and a seal was not going to work out, and I couldn't figure out why for me it wasn't working out. It just felt awkward. It just felt wrong when I would write them together, um, even though both characters are very interested in each other. This is really sounds really woo woo, doesn't it? Both <laughs> characters are really interested in each other, but I just knew it wasn't going to work between them. But that's exactly. And I couldn't figure out what it was, and it was because Sage was not honest. The person she pretended to be, and a seal, could have had a really wonderful relationship. The person she was, who is, I feel very sorry for, who is broken, who is scared, who is desperate, that person could not have a relationship with a seal. And she couldn't let him get too close to her because he would, he would have seen her, he would have found her out. And that's why their their relationship never really worked out. That was sad. Oh, this is an interesting one. Do you think if Mercy was a werewolf, she, would she be very dominant or more middle of the pack? Where would you place her on her own without being mated? Okay, Mercy on her own without being mated. All the women go to the bottom of the pack. Um, in Adam's pack, where they're kind of starting to shuffle, where people are members of the pack according to where their wolves perceive them instead of where the people think they should be stuck. Um, Mercy is not an Omega. Uh, Mercy, if she were, she would probably be dead because she couldn't <laughs> stop poking. There's no way on earth she would take orders. I have no idea where she would, where she would be placed. She's not an Omega because she doesn't do, she doesn't calm anybody that's not her thing uh, she causes chaos that's her thing i think that any alpha worth her salt would kick her out of the pack <laughs> unless she took over the and, pack. <laughs> unless she took over the pack and i don't know that she's dominant enough to do that she is she doesn't go head to head um uh, that's why she sneaks behind right that's why she played played all the played all the pranks on um on brand she doesn't, she's, she's not stupid. Um, maybe if she were a powerful werewolf, if she knew that she could wipe the floor with everybody, then maybe she'd be pretty dominant. But she doesn't want to be in charge. She just wants, she to, fix just wants to fix things. And so I would maybe midway up the pack, mostly because she didn't want to be any, but any higher than that. And maybe all the way at the bottom of the pack, she doesn't want to be any higher than that. And it certainly would not bother her to be the least dominant or, <laughs> uh, dominant, dominant, or dominant wolf in the pack, as long as nobody tried to give her orders. She'd be fine. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. It's a very good question. Okay, this one is, it's not really a spoiler, it's a brief mention in Smoke Bitten, so maybe people want to put okay. their ears again. Okay. Is the case that went bad for Warren a foreshadowing of a new Warren detective story? It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. I had that thought while I was writing it. I needed him to be in a certain mood and some things, you know, some, some things going on. I like to put little things in the book that makes it feel like the characters have lives outside of what the book is. So outside of what Mercy knows about and, and things. So I like that. Um, it might be, uh, I certainly need to write some more short stories. I can feel them kind of burbling to the top, but I want to get the next Alpha and Omega done first, uh, Wild Sign. Um, so I probably won't be working on any short stories except for the one that, oh, except for the one that I for owe Carrie. to write that for, for um, Carrie Hughes. Uh, I've got a, a story that I need to get done by June for her. So maybe something there. Oh, speaking of short stories, I will just do a plug. 
So this is coming out in April, April 6th, uh, April 6th and it has another Asil story. For those of you who have not read the Asil stories, Asil was given um, uh, dates by concerned friends uh, around Chris for Christmas, <laughs> which he puzzles him because he's not a Christian. But um, and they're blind the, dates and they're blind dates uh, with people found on dating websites. And the first one was um, people who were pretending to be vampires. Um, which he thinks is really stupid, but anyway, that was his, that anybody would pretend to be a vampire if they weren't a vampire, you know. Um, and that was uh, um, fantastic holiday season. And it was two. thank you. It was in the fantastic holiday season volume two, uh, Kevin Kevin Anderson's uh, anthology. So this one has a seals. The next short story. It's not his second date. It's his third date. But you find out what happened in the second date. The second date is must love cats. Um, is the website. And I told Patty she if she's not going to write about that one, she owes us another short story. Okay, so um, so this <laughs> one is a seal and the knot date. And I hope you enjoy that. And there's a lot of really good stories in there. Don't just get it from mine. Um, but there we go. There's my blurb. Oh, since we're blurring for books, let me blurb oh, for this yeah. one too. Um, all of you eat your hearts out because I got this one advanced. It's wonderful. I really think Harry is um, for these troubled times where with, with the coronavirus um, scares. I think there's something super reassuring about Harry Dresden and this book is awesome. And I was a little concerned when I finished it because I thought, oh, people have been waiting all these years for the next Harry Dresden and it ends on a, it ends on a yeah, I don't know. Cliffhangers kind of, yes, sort of. Okay. And I went, uh-oh, if he doesn't come up with another book soon, he might get eaten alive by his fans who are, who are already tortured by um, George Martin. And, uh, and then I was informed today, and I think I posted on my Facebook, informed today that there is a second book, um, Battleground, mm -hmm. which will be out in September, which is the second half of the story. The, um, so you won't have to wait for very long, and I get to wait less long than you do. <laughs> there are some, there are some, there are some perks to sharing an editor uh, with Jim Butcher, and that. But um, he and I, he and I, and Charlene Harris and Dan Dos Santos, my cover artist, were all supposed to go to MissCon this year, and I hopefully hope, we still hopefully will. it'll still go on, which is um, in the end of May. Um, but uh, we'll have to we'll have to wait and see on that. I'm I'm kind of uh, putting a peg in any of those giant gatherings of people who really want to see each other and will go whether they're sick or not. I, I worry a little bit about whether we should put those on or not. Hopefully by then this will have, uh, will have gotten through the worst of this. Okay. okay. All right. Will you go back to Hurag? I would love a story of Tisala and Ward's kids. Oh, wonderful. I only actually thought of their kids. I thought of Ward's, Ward's brother. Um, and I thought of Oreg, doing a story for Oreg. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think I've said this uh, in public before, and I'm just going to have to sit down and do it. Um, I really think I should do some short, some, some traditional fantasy short stories. Um, maybe go visit, revisit all the worlds that I've written in, the Sinem books and Hirog books and Hobbs Bargain. There's, but I do have another book, in the, at least one in the Dragon series that I need to write. Um, and I also would like to write an, another trilogy, I think, or, or a duology or something in the, um, uh, um, the Raven books. I said another trilogy. It's a, another duology or maybe a trilogy in the, in the world of the Ravens because I really liked writing that and that was a lot of fun. But um, if there is world enough in time, I, I plan on revisiting the Dragonborn's world for sure. Next one. Will we hear about Bran's daughter who passed away? Will we hear about Bran's daughter who passed away? I don't know. We'll find out. That would make you cry. I don't like seeing you cry. Right. Only it's a happy story in the end. So I don't know. Um, will you find out about it as, a, as side stories in the books as they keep going? Maybe. Um, I don't mind talking about past tragedies. So so there may be, may be some uh, when, it, when it's the right story for the right um, place in the book than maybe. Um, I find a lot of, I, I know a lot of history about all of these characters. I've been with them for a very long time. Um, it helps me make them react in a predictable fashion because I know who they are. So they, they stay the same from one book to the other. And I found that their histories tend to come out when I least expect it. So 
No promises, but maybe. <laughs> Which leads into this next question. When will we find out about Sherwood Post's past? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know what it is. I know what it is. And um, when, when it's funny <laughs> or when, it, when it's important to the story. I think we found we got big clues this last uh, in Storm Curse. There were big clues for who Sher Sherwood Post was, um, and uh, not so much in this book. Um, but uh, yeah, you'll find out. But I'm not sure. It, it it has to be the right story for it, and so far um, it hasn't been. Oh, this is a tough one. Who is your favorite sci-fi and fantasy author? Oh, oh my goodness. Oh impossible. my goodness. Right. Impo absolutely impossible. I uh, too many. absolutely impossible. Too many. And and it changes with moods. I've been reading uh, I've been re listening, actually, sorry. I've been re listening to the Lois McMaster Bush old books. I started out re listening to her fantasy books, which I've not read as many times as I've read her Borkosica novels, and then I just I I caved and went back and, and listened to um the uh, let's see the Warriors Apprentice, which is which is a fan, excuse me is a science fiction novel. It sounds like it should be fantasy. War, uh, Warriors Apprentice, Warlords Apprentice, Warriors Apprentice, mm -hmm. Warriors Apprentice, the Vor game, and then jumped over to Komar and the Civil Campaign, mm -hmm. which are almost a duology, and it's it's they're just delightful. I just felt like I needed something um cheerful and fun and uh they're not always cheerful and fun mm -hmm. but they have great they have great spas of triumphant uh funny parts so i love her uh jim butcher is amazing alona andrews is amazing charlene harris is amazing um uh, kim harrison uh kelly armstrong i could i could probably go on and sparky and i were talking about linnea sinclair the other day i haven't read uh, linnea for a few years i don't know that she's writing anymore but she did some wonderful science fiction and romance books um maybe 10 years ago mm -hmm. and they were they're awesome they're really fun so Right. All right. Uh, when will we address the werewolf bay infertility? I feel bad for Arielle and Anna. Oh, when will we f address the werewolf fae infertility? I address it all the time. It can't be, it, it, in my world, it can't be better to be a member of the supernatural races than it is to be human because that takes away, that means Everybody wonder, wonders around going, oh, I wish I were a werewolf. I wish I were a vampire. And even if that happens in real life, oh, I really actually don't wish I was one of my werewolves. I don't wish I was one of my fae or one of my vampires. I'm okay. So as long as I feel that way about it, I, th I think I've, I've hit it pretty good. Um, it's just the that the fae have trouble reproducing is just an ongoing that has always um, been, it's a, it's a, I, I don't think that it is actually a folk tradition it's a very yes, it time. is for it sure. Is. It is. Sorry, mm -hmm. sorry. I, that's, I, that's why they have that's change why lanes. And, yes. Yeah. So, so that is not something I feel like I need to address. If you have a creature who are immortal, it should be hard for them to reproduce, or they would take over the world, um, or else either it, hard for them to reproduce, or else they die really fast for other reasons. Um, but uh, and the werewolf infertility, I think, is just one of those things that those women have to deal with, and the men too have to deal with, and it, it um, gives me power for story power. It's uh, potential energy for stories, so I don't think um, I will ever take it away. And certainly, there will be times where they try uh, try to do surrogates, and and but I don't. I'm of a certain age. Most, some of you are younger. Anybody my age or older will remember the very first test tube baby and what hell she went and her parents went through um, to, for in vitro. I don't remember if it was in vitro fertilization or what, um, but, but um, people tend to not take that kind of thing very lightly. So we'll see what kind of, that might be a really good book too. We'll see. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It'll be fun. It'll be an adventure. Yeah, a good adventure, hopefully. Oh, never. <laughs> I wake up every morning and I pinch myself, grateful that I'm a writer and not a protagonist in an urban fantasy series. <laughs> Will Warren and Kyle get more of their own stories? Will Warren and Kyle get more of their own stories? Probably. I like them. Kyle's snarky. It makes me happy. And it's kind of fun to be able to show Warren um, 
through his own eyes or through Kyle's eyes instead of through Mercy's eyes because Mercy looks at him as sort of a big like her big brother who can't do anything wrong who's kind of a teddy bear and you don't survive what Warren has survived by being a teddy bear <laughs> so unless it's a kind of a grizzly teddy bear maybe I don't know we'll see. <laughs> Have Charles and Anna and Adam and Mercy ever managed to go on a trip such as a honeymoon that didn't involve business? No. <laughs> That's my life. It's the life of every writer. Wherever you go, there's business. Um, not so much, maybe not so much in I don't write everywhere. Well, sometimes I do. Um, but that everything is grist for the mill. And I figure if my kids had to put up with it, then and and uh, my family had to put up with it and then you guys all have to put up with it with my characters yeah <laughs> will there be more of vampire thomas i hope so i really like his story i think he's i think he's a fun um i think he's just he's just a fun person to play with um he's so shut down and that's a challenge i like those things cool. plus i think he's sexy so <laughs> He is, and scary. Uh, this question is more about werewolf infertility, which we actually have addressed. So I'll move okay. on to the next. Is Bran the oldest werewolf in the U.S.? Is Bran the oldest werewolf in the U.S.? No. <laughs> and you're evil. I'm not going to tell us anymore. No, I'm not going to tell you anymore. <laughs> See, you all thought she was nice. All right, next question. Will Warren and Kyle get married at some point? Yes. Off screen or on screen, I don't know, but yes. Awesome. They're not quite there yet. Um, I think I think you guys should meet Kyle's family. <laughs> Maybe I'll do that. Sorry. Well, that would be kind of fun, right? Right. <laughs> in in a in a look who's coming to supper kind of way. <laughs> I guess look who's coming to dinner. Yeah. Oh, this next one is kind of not going to work in the here and now, I can tell you right now. Have you ever thought of doing a Columbia Basin Impact Convention in the Tri-Cities, showing all the places? Not today. <laughs> not this year. <laughs> um, we've, we've, uh, I did a virtual tour for our local, uh, our local newspaper one time, and we've done, um, we did a camp out over at Mary Hill one time. I don't, I don't know. I'm a little... I'm a little less open to things like that, I guess, since Mike passed away. Um, it just, it's a little harder for me to uh, be comfortable uh, in large groups of people I don't know um, without Mike at my side. So I don't know about that. We'll have to see. Plus a lot of the places um, in the books, you don't necessarily want to be doing a tour to people's homes. True, true, homes. true. A lot of the places in the books, I don't want to do tours. And a lot of the places in the books, I deliberately changed where they were. So I didn't have people knocking on people's doors. So um, Warren's old apartment was based on a friend of mine's apartment. They're, they're, they, they've long since moved on and, and are elsewhere, but um, I know where it is. And um, I didn't describe it so anybody else would know where it is, I don't think. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, like I set a scene with where the, the house burnt down with dead vampires in it. I think that it, that is actually a friend of mine's house and I don't want people to go to her house. And, um, and then I made up a church. I took a church in Butte, that I grew up in in Butte, Montana and moved it into the tri cities and stuck it over where there's a bunch of old churches built in the seventies, just like that one was. So, Hey. <laughs> so some of the places don't exist. Um, but I think that I, you know, in a way for me, doing a tour of the Tri-City, a mercy tour of the Tri-Cities defeats the purpose of storytelling, right, for me. Um, I don't say that readers shouldn't do it. I think that would be really fun for readers to go around and see if they could pick out things. But I think that's it should be like a scavenger hunt. Can you figure, take the clues? Can you figure out what she's talking about? That would be fun. Ooh. But um uh, for me, for me to do it, it feels a little too um, like I'm I'm taking the reality of my story and I'm I'm taking away from it because the places at here, the solid real places here, in the contrast, just wrong. It's like if you lived in when you live in a manufactured home, and I have, they're lovely, they're wonderful, as long as if you fix them, you fix them with the parts that are just like that. 
So my husband wanted to put in a hardwood floor into our manufactured home. And I had to prove to him that you did not want to, that a pergo floor is fine, but a, a hardwood floor in a manufactured home is very difficult because you put a hardwood floor in, it makes everything else look bad. So you have to just gradually replace everything else in the house to make it to make it fit in. Whereas the house by itself looked very nice and was very comfortable and, and wonderful without that. So that that's what I feel like is if I take if I, if you ground if you come in and you see the real thing, it makes my stories feel not as real. Maybe I don't know. I'm making that up, but that's where I'm at. That's what you get paid for. Yeah. <laughs> Constance says it's been an hour, but she's good to keep going if we are. Okay, um, let's maybe go another 15 minutes and then we'll call it. I've noticed I'm getting babbly. And when I get babbly, it's kind of a bad sign. So let's go another 15 minutes and maybe another two questions. Sure, there, well, there's a whole bunch oh, of questions. Oh, there's a whole bunch more questions. Lots more. Okay, okay. Well, let's, let's, right. let's go for it. I'll, I'll try to answer them quickly and we'll maybe get through as many as we can in 15 minutes. Okay. Why did you choose Mercy specific? botanic background versus say Ford or Chevrolet? Uh, because we owned Volkswagens <laughs> and I knew they were weird and we had a Volkswagen van with the engine in the back all the way in the back and the radiator in the front all the way in the front and my husband got to turn the wrench on that and I knew a lot of weird stories about Volkswagen mechanic game and the, the Volkswagens themselves are, are they're just an awesome quirky car especially the older ones so that's where that came from is that I you know, write what you know. It's not what I knew. It's what Mike knew. But um, I've been around enough of it to gather stories. So that's where that came from. <laughs> Next one. I'm rereading Shifting Shadows. And in Roses in Winter, there's mention of an Alaskan alpha named Silver Pete. A seal says he's not as big a legend that a seal himself is, but obviously he's well known enough among the wolves and very old with a badass name and was supposed to have died a hundred years before. Will we ever get his story or get to meet him? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> I like Silver Pete. He's, he's, um, he went to Alaska um, in the gold rush, but he had a story before that. So yeah, no, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> More short stories. Right, right. There's a, there's a temptation for me. I love writing new characters. But when you write, that is, okay, most of the things I really love about writing a long, long, uh, long running series because you can build all of the side characters, even the even walk on parts, eventually fill in and become real characters. And, and it's as fun for me, I hope, as it is for you. I hope you have fun with it. But it's really tempting to just bring on more and more and more real new characters. And I don't want to do that to the point where I lose the old ones. But I can see doing a short story with Silver Pete or at least bringing him in as a, as a, a scary boogeyman or something, you know. Hey? Oh, this is a funny one. How does one diaper a coyote pup? <laughs> With persistence. And I would not use paper diapers. I think a cloth diaper might actually work. But And, and then Bran would say, why would you diaper a puppy? Pee pads. The pee pads. Yeah, yeah. So there you are. You know, those medieval guys, they just don't have the same the same ideas about bodily functions that we do. You know? Do you think the pack has accepted Mercy and see Christy for what she is? Um, not maybe this way Mercy does. Mercy, Mercy in this book uh, says that she loves Adam and Jesse, and because she loves Adam and Jesse, she can never like Christy. And but most people don't get most even members of the pack don't get inside Adam's head as well as Mercy does. So they don't understand what she does, to, what Christy has done to him and what she does to him. So with that, with and that's the big evil. That is the big evil is what she's done to Jesse and Adam. And if you never saw that, and you only saw this wonderful woman who made you really good food and told funny stories and made you feel good about yourself as you broke your back trying to help her out doing something else. Um, it's, uh, I don't know. I have known a couple of people like this in my life. Um, who, who I sit back and watch and I go, why doesn't anybody see through them? And it's because they're very good at making people happy, um, at being their, at being their, uh, minions. And, and, and I will say that one of the people that I knew who was like this was very good, was a good person. Um, but most of them are not. Um, I don't know. I don't know that I'll bring it up much 
unless the story calls for it. This one did because I needed people, I needed, I was doing a sleight of hand, and again, this is a, this is a, um, uh, sort of a spoiler for the book, but it's in the first chapter of Smoke Bitten. I needed a sleight of hand to make readers think I was talking about one thing when I was really talking about the other. So I, I wanted people to think I was talking about Christy when really she was just a foil to bring out the real problems that were there. She really, it was, it was, it was not about Christy at all. None of this was about Christy. Adam's reaction wasn't about Christy. Um, Ariely's uh, uh, faux pas was not about Christy. It was about trying, she wanted to feel better about herself, so she was going to help her friend. And, and Adam was broken, and so he overreacted and misreacted to things, just like normal people do. And my sleight of hand was, here, pay attention to Christy people until you figure, like, mercy figures out what's really going on. Uh, did Char this is an A and O question. Did Charles change from a baby or did it happen at a certain age? He changed from a baby. He's the only baby, he was the only baby werewolf that Adam or that uh, um, that uh, uh, Bran ever knows about. Yeah, he changed from a baby. Here's my question. Did he pee on the rug? Yes. <laughs> Except there wasn't a rug, so there. <laughs> so there's something to be said for dirt floor. <laughs> okay, so what do you think about Tad and Jesse together? Are they friends or potentially more? You'll have to see, just like me. You'll have to see. <laughs> right now, they're really good friends, and she needs a really good friend right now. Yeah. With the werewolf reveal or coming out, how would a human approach becoming a werewolf? Would they apply? Are they quietly chosen? To be one is to know one, or do you just ask? Um, yeah, all of the above. I mean, uh, they're not going to induct a werewolf, a human into it being a werewolf that they don't know really well. That, that doesn't have, so most of them have sponsors. Another werewolf who comes up and says, yeah, this guy, there's a reason why he wants to be a werewolf. It's a good reason. I'm good for it. You know, a mate or a, or a nasty disease or something like that. Um, and, and that they're, they're only you know, Bran knows the kind of people can be changed into werewolves. Not everybody can change, could survive the change. So, um, but yeah, that's that's how I see it. Would there be forms that they would have to fill out? Would there be forms? You know, I did a, I, 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 in one version of one of the stories, I had a, I had a, um, things you should, I had a, um, Things you should know before you decide to be a werewolf uh, thing that I that I actually took out I think but I maybe I'll put it back in <laughs> I, thought it was, I thought it was funny but it struck kind of the wrong note so I pulled it out <laughs> especially if Mercy tried to write it right Ooh. right right well yeah wouldn't it be better if Mercy tried to write it yeah. <laughs> any plans on bringing Gary back yes absolutely Gary's going to be back I love Gary he's so awful. Do, yeah I know exactly that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Will we hear the ever hear the full chocolate Easter bunny story? Yes, as soon as I find one that's not potentially fatal. <laughs> I had one in mind. I know it, it, in my uh, I, he's passed away. I can say that. So the statue of limitations is gone. Um, so my husband and a whole bunch of gr group of boys pulled it on their. Um, he was working for the. Oh my gosh, the people who build the trails. It's youth the conservation. Forest. Youth conservation corps. He was working when he was a, a kid uh, in high school. He went and was working with the Youth Conservation Corps, and they had a guy in charge who was brutal, just brutal. Uh, Buckmeyer. Boy, that I remember that. I do remember it because Mike would always, the kids would go, how far have we come? And he goes, it's about a Buckmeyer mile, which meant, you know, they would say, how long, how long is it is to camp? And he would go, about a mile. And 10 miles later, they go, how long is it to camp? About a mile. So they had a unit of distance called Buckmeyer Mile, which was the distance between where you were and where you wanted to go at any place in time. <laughs> so um, they did this, this terrible thing to him at the very end of that. And it could have been fatal. It wasn't. But it was, Mike always said it was a really dumb ass thing. To, sorry, dumb thing to do. <laughs> and um, that, was, that was what I had in mind. So I'm going to have to have to put my thinking cap on and see if I can come up with something because I don't want to tell people this and have them do it and have them kill somebody. <laughs> so let's not do that. How did Z get Tad to wear the magical shirt? Um, the I don't know. 
<laughs> I don't know. I bribery. have to make I, maybe maybe bribery with that. My my uh, minion in the back row says bribery, and that may have been it. <laughs> I don't know. But on the other hand, when Brian, when, when Z tells you to do something, even if you're Tad, sometimes you oh, do it. Yeah. yeah. Out of curiosity, you've mentioned a book you tried to write with an outline that slowed to a crawl. Which book was it? Uh, Raven Strike. Yeah. It took me longer to write. Actually, it took me longer to write the outline than it took me to write most of the books I write. And then, um, uh, and then the book. It was really hard for me to start on the book because I already knew how it happened, and I didn't. I'm like, okay, I know that. Why? Why do I want to? And in the end, it was fine. But uh, will you ever release companion books to the series, mm -hmm. like Ariana's Fay book? Oh, okay. Um, probably not. Um, that sounds like I have X amount of time and I am really good at writing novels. I'm a, I'm best, I'm better at writing novels. Let's say really good is probably the wrong term. I'm better at writing novels than at anything else. And when I try to do anything else, it takes away from my novel writing time where I'd rather write, where, where I'd rather do that. So probably not. Did Bran know King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table? One of the knights was a werewolf, maybe Bran. Sir Maroc. Sir Maroc was the werewolf. Um, that's where he gets the Maroc, right? Or, or Merrick, depending on Sir Merrick, depending on which story you read. Um, uh, he knew several. They were not the way they are in the movies or maybe even in the stories. And I don't know how much I will do with them because I have a little bit of a hard time um, uh, playing with, I think maybe I think maybe the most I'm gonna do with the Arthurian novels is what I did in Hunting Ground, unless something really comes to me. Um, the most I'll do with the Arthurian legends. So, so yeah, that means no, um, Sherwood was not one of the Arthurian knights. <laughs> as far as I know. <laughs> there, there, there you have it. Good save. Okay. Ooh, oh, this is the last question. Uh, what about the Native American myth, Coyote? I'm not quite sure what the question is. But the question is, um, so, so I don't know. I know the Native American stories from growing up in Montana. Um, and I have some friends who are Native American and I grew up and I went to school at Montana State University in Bozeman and we had a gentleman who was Native who lived at, uh, above us and uh, was awesome. He was just awesome. Uh, his wife was the the principal in Lame Deer, the school district in Lame Deer, I think. He was coming back, I think, to get his master's degree. But he would, he, he would have sings. Um, at night on weekends and Mike and I would open up our windows and just sit there and listen because it was so freaking cool really nice guy so and I don't know what that has to do with stories about Native American legends but um, I grew up at, I'm a child of the 60s and in the 60s the Native American stories were really um, romanticized and were uh, maybe because of the Native American rights the people fighting for Native American rights um, and they were bastardized, so they were taken and made into um, stories that would appeal to white Anglo-Saxon Protestant kids, uh, instead of left in their own uh, their own setting, which was sad. Um, but that, and I don't know if that's been corrected or not, but it was something that I paid a lot of attention to because my mother was a children's librarian, so I I've, I've read Native American stories my whole life, and I'm very well aware that um, there's a difference between the real stories and some of the stories that gets tra translated for kids and things and and kind of try to walk a really respectful tightrope and make sure that um i don't tread on anybody's feet with these well it helps that you have native friends that you've been talking to as well yeah well and and we and and i do yeah so and and i have um so far not run into bed anybody who is native who has objected to having mercy be half native uh, mostly everybody seems to be really happy to see somebody who looks like them in, in as a major protagonist of the story so that works for me um, before i close i thought i would tell you introduce my friends who are behind me right here this is a carousel horse i'm going to see if i can move the camera a little bit so you can see him a little bit more 
he is a uh, yeah, there we go. Oh, I don't get seasick. There, he's a hippocampus, which is the traditional carousel horse type, carved by my friend Ed Roth. Um, you can look him up at A and E Sculptures and see. You probably see represented this. This is, I think, the most beautiful carousel horse ever carved. Um, he's a good. He's he's. I just love him. And then the painting behind that, I'm going to switch this a little, sorry, in the wrong direction. That's just as weird that I just have to turn that way. Um, the painting behind me is a Bob Eggleton, and you're not going to be able to see all of it. Um, uh, it's glorious. It's just beautiful. Um, my husband picked it up the first time we went to a world con and met Bob and his wife. So, all right. Um, I just really appreciate you all coming out and visiting with us. I really miss doing the book signing tour and coming out and talking to readers and finding out what you're excited about and what you liked and what you didn't like. Um, and uh, hopefully next year we'll be able to do this again. Support your local bookstores, support your local businesses of all kinds, if you can, however you can. The restaurant, local restaurants, um, the chains will survive, but your, your local places are, are in uh, tough water right now. And Constance's, uh, they do ship. They do ship from from Mysterious Galaxy. So and they have books they can send out and the signed book plates that you signed for Okay, them. I have signed book plates and that we I signed for um, Mysterious Galaxy that you can pick up or at request. And they can ship out the book if you went to order it, if you would order it from them. And they are amazing. They're so friendly and so nice there. They're a super, they're a super store. I really, really enjoy doing events there. And everybody's friendly and they, they pay attention to their customers. And um, they do they do many author events and, and support their community too. So and they remember what you like, and I spend way too much money there. <laughs> So thank you very much. You are awesome. And I really appreciate you being here. I'm going to end this now. And save so people can look at it who didn't have And we'll, we'll see if I can save it. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Good night. Thank you. Good night.